<laughs> Excellent. Can I have your attention, please? Excellent. Thank you. Thank you for coming out. A lot of energy in the room. I want to remind, remind everyone this is a this is a big ball. Um, the, the speaker will be in here shortly, but um, remember when we're instructors and when we're in this room, we know to be monitoring. Uh, but small conversations in a room this size can distract from the talks. So I want to give you one reminder right now. We've got a nice turnout today, and that means silence during the talk, unless you want to ask a question of the speaker, then raise your hand. Probably. But just because we have a great turnout today, I want to remind us about that because it, it can detract. And we've had really great um, talks in recent weeks and uh, great behavior from the audience. And I appreciate that very much. In fact, today marks the final speaker in the 89th semester of What Physicists Do. I'd like to um, thank our generous private donors and the instructionally related activities funding that we have that allows us to bring in these speakers um, and to support this series. Um, at this point, I wanted to um, thank uh, my student assistants. This semester, um, I had uh, the, the help of um, Karina Smith, who's joined me. Um, and, and on her way outgoing is Amon Gill. And I wanted to um, give her a, a gift for her two and a half years of meritorious service in helping run the series as a student assistant. Um, she's going to go off to graduate school, and so I got her a book to take the kind of notes that you should all be taking here today uh, when she goes to her colloquia series in graduate school. So I'd like us to all thank Karina Smith and Amon Gray. <laughs> You're welcome. All right, so um, um, with those um, things out of uh, 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 done, um, I'd like to um, let the 494 students, we have Physics 494 who are taking this for credit, not those of you here for extra credit um, or the members of the public, but for those of you taking the course for credit, we're having our final review, grade check-in, um, and discussion of the semester at this time. So that should only be those of you enrolled in 494 should be here next week uh, for a regular um, course period. Um, today's speaker is Dr. Zhaosheng Huang. Uh, he's from the University of San Francisco. Uh, uh, he was recommended to me by Aparna, um, who's there at that department, who's spoken in the series. Um, his work is, is one of the most fascinating topics, and I think that's one of the reasons we have such a great turnout here today. Um, it's in the topic of cosmology, but in, uh, specifically, uh, he looks at, at, in two areas, he does some work in gravitational lensing that we've had talks on in the series, uh, but I believe today he's going to be talking about his work on um, type 1a supernova. And so these are the cosmological standard candles that allow us to measure amazing things, including um, uh, the, the, the finding from uh, around, right around 90 uh, that the universe was not only expanding, but its expansion was accelerating, uh, which, which won the Nobel Prize. Um, Dr. Zhaosheng Huang uh, has his PhD from UC Berkeley, and uh, your bachelor's is from Kent State, I believe. Um, and he has been at San Francisco, uh, University of San Francisco for the past couple of years. And uh, I've checked into this. Uh, he's, he's a very well-respected uh, professor in his, in his classes and, and teaching. So we're, we're thrilled to have him and to have him talk about his work today. Let's give a warm welcome to Dr. Hong. <laughs> My pleasure to be here to uh, talk to you a little bit about um, cosmology, type 1a supernova. In particular, I want to focus on the journey of a photon that originates from a type 1a supernova and arrives at a, a detector of one of our telescopes. Um, 
So uh, we'll be talking about uh, the journey of, of the photon through dust cloud, as well as gravitational lenses. <clears throat> the story really has to start from uh, my collaborators, without whom uh, I don't know if I'll be able to get anything done. Um, my main collaborators are uh, Greg Aldrin, who's a senior scientist um, at Lawrence Berkeley Lab. Uh, so Perlmutter is, is our PI. And I also have two undergraduate, uh, undergraduate students, uh, Zachary Raha and Andrew Stalker, who've been working with me on one of the projects. All right, so uh, we have to start from, uh, here's the outline, and we have to start from 100 years ago. Uh, I don't know how many of you know this, but this year is the 100th year, 100th anniversary of when Einstein finally, first for the first time, and <coughs> also finally got his field equation right for general relativity. It was fascinating to read a little bit of the story of how he developed uh, his field equation for general relativity. He didn't get it right the first time. He uh, talked with his, his colleagues and it took him a couple of tries before he finally got it right. Uh, it is generally considered that this particular paper uh, published in November 25th, 1915. That was the first time that the correct equation, the correct field equation for general relativity was written down. And it's wonderful with the internet these days, you can look up not only the original paper, but the English translation. Everything is online. So this is at uh, an archive uh, um, hosted by, uh, uh, by, by Princeton. So if you're interested, uh, this is the original paper uh, where the field equations were first written down correctly. Einstein, being a genius, um, quickly realized that he can apply his field equations to the universe as a whole. So in less than a year and a half, uh, so here I have the English translation, but for some reason, this English translation doesn't have the publication date. So I dug out the, the German, uh, the original German paper. It's published February 1917. So less than a, a year and a half later, uh, he wrote the first paper on cosmology applying his field equations for general relativity to the entire universe. And he quickly realized that if you adhere to the cosmological principle, which states the universe is the same everywhere and in all directions, then it cannot possibly be true that the universe has anything at all. In other words, uh, the, the, it, so you know, for, for the physics majors, you, you have all seen Poisson equations. If you apply Poisson equation to the entire universe and you insist that the universe is the same everywhere and is, it is the same in all directions, it immediately leads to the conclusion that the universe is empty. Now, of course, the universe is not empty. And so Einstein decided that the Poisson equation needs fixing. So he fixed it. And the way he fixed it was he inserted a constant. Lambda is a constant. Phi is the gravitational potential. This, of course, the Poisson equation, of course, is the non relativistic version uh, the non-relativistic description of gravity. It's not the correct uh, description, uh, but uh, so the, the constant that he inserted, he actually inserted into his correct field equation. But if you were to do the translation from the, the relativistic field equation to the non-relativistic <coughs> case, uh, this is how the constant will show up. And when I saw this equation a couple days ago, I've never looked at the original paper before. I saw this a couple days ago, I was like, wait a second, that's not hard remembering the textbook. So that really puzzled me. I looked back and forth and I said, what went wrong? It turns out that even though Einstein correctly inserted the famous constant, which I'll tell you more about, into his field equation, when he wrote down the non-relativistic version of it, he did not insert that constant in the correct way. This was pointed out first by uh, uh, an author in 1965 and then by two others 20 years later. So if you look in any uh, cosmology textbook, this is the equation you will see. This is the correct way of inserting that constant lambda. So it's interesting to know that Einstein made plenty of mistakes before he got things right. Um, anyway, so as some of you probably know, this is the famous cosmological constant. Okay. Einstein realized that he had to insert that constant in order to have a universe that has something that is static <coughs> and that also adheres to the cosmological principle. Okay. So that's the starting of our story. This is uh, Einstein around the time when he published uh, his first paper on cosmology, 1920. Okay. Um, 
About a dozen years later, in 1929, Edwin Hubble, an American astronomer, made two astonishing discoveries. The first is that our galaxy is not the only galaxy out there. Objects that people call nebulae, some of them, it turned out, they were galaxies in their own rights. And that's already a huge discovery. He also further discovered that those extragalactic objects, those um, nebulae that are outside of our galaxy, they are moving away from us. Quantitatively, the farther away they are from, from us, the faster they are moving. So he measured for those objects their velocity and their distance. And he made this plot. And if you're a physicist, you may hesitate. What does that tell us? If you're an astronomer, you go, of course it's a straight line. There's no question about it. So he drew a straight line, and he figured out the um, slope. And uh, uh, so, so this is the famous Hubble's law, uh, that velocity of an object, as it moves away from us, is linearly proportional to its distance from us. Okay? Uh, and this is um, Edwin Hubble about 10 years, 8 years after he made the discovery. And this is the telescope on which uh, he made observations, took the photographs, which allowed him to measure both the velocity and the distance. Okay? Now, uh, this relates to uh, what Einstein, uh, Einstein's work. Einstein looked at the stars, and as, as far as the astronomers could tell, the stars, for the most part, uh, are static. They are, you know, of course, moving, but they're moving in a random fashion. There's not a particular pattern to it. Um, so on average, they can, they can be considered as, as static. But when Edwin, when Edwin Hubble made this discovery, of course, everything changed. The universe is no longer static. Okay. All right. Now, this picture, if you look at it, you may think that it suggests to you that the universe, that we are the center of the universe. Everything's moving away from us. The farther they are away from us, the faster they move, right? That is not the case. That is not the case. So we, we're not going to go back before the time of current is. Um, and the way to understand this, and there are you know, various ways of, of uh, uh, different sort of you know, uh, simple models to help people understand why it is that even though uh, this, this is the correct observation, we're not at the center of the universe. Uh, this is probably the best example, the, the best model, so everyone now gravitates towards uh, that example. So I'm going to use that example as well. Uh, it's actually taken from a, a well-known textbook. Um, so suppose you uh, make raisin bread. I don't know well, who among you bakers would put raisins uh, on, on the uh, equal space lattice like that, but let, you know, let's say you do that. Um, and not only on the surface, but inside as well. Right? So Three-dimensional array of raisins. And if you bake it, let's say it takes an hour. I'm not a baker at all, so let's say, uh, sure, an hour. An hour. Uh, an hour later, every raisin has moved away from every other raisin. So let's take a particular raisin. Let's, let's put a little milk stain on this raisin. So that's our raisin. Every raisin represents a galaxy. And let's say that that raisin represents our galaxy. Okay? Now, if you look at raisin number one here, before baking, it's one centimeter away. After baking, three centimeters away. Yes? So in one hour, it had moved two centimeters. In other words, during the baking process, it was moving at two centimeters per hour. Okay? Now let's look at raisin number two. Uh, before baking, it's two centimeters away from our raisin. After baking, it's six centimeters. So in one hour, it has moved four centimeters. In other words, during the baking process, it's moving at four centimeters per hour. I hope you see the pattern. The farther away the, 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 the raisin, the faster it appears to move. And every raisin in this raisin bread will reach the same conclusion. You don't have to be at the center of the universe to reach that conclusion. So the cosmological principle uh, is not violated. Okay. And the logical conclusion is not that we're at the center of the universe, but that the universe is expanding. And when Einstein learned this, he was greatly disappointed. He could have predicted this. He could have said, look, if I believe my field equation, if I believe that I don't need to do anything to change it, to, to fudge it, to fit reality, then the universe cannot be static. He didn't, and so he considered him. He, he considered this his biggest blunder. Uh, it's it's um, well known among physicists. 
All right. Um, so I want to make a note that when you hear people say the expansion of the universe uh, it, it is the, it's really the expansion of, of space and time, uh, that really is true. It's not just the expansion of space, but it's also the expansion of time. Uh, everyone who's taken special activity knows that something's moving very fast, there's time dilation. So when a galaxy is moving very, uh, when, when a galaxy is very far away, which also is moving very fast, time dilates. So it really is the expansion of both space and time. Okay, so uh, at this point, uh, I don't know how many of you are astronomers, astrophysicists, students of astronomy, of, of astronomy. so I, I, I need to introduce uh, a few terms. I, I'm going to try to introduce as few terms as possible, but there are a few terms that are so essential to the, to the discussion that I have to define it, and hopefully that you will uh, understand um, uh, the, these quantities better as we go along. Astronomers use this quantity called redshift, and it tells you the following. Let's say we're looking at a galaxy, a galaxy that's very far away. It emits a photon. During the time that the photon travels through the space between that galaxy and us, the universe has expanded. So by the time the photon has arrived, the, uh, the, 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 the uh, space has been stretched. And so the photon would appear to have a longer wavelength. Okay? And so the wavelength at emission and the wavelength when it's observed are different. We take the ratio of the two, it's going to be greater than 1, so we're going to uh, call, the, call the ratio 1 plus z, and z is the ratio. Okay. Uh, so you can turn this around to say that the quantity 1 over 1 plus z uh, sort of tells you uh, the relative size of the universe. Uh, so what I mean by that is that uh, if the galaxy is very nearby, then the wavelength at emission is about the same as the wavelength when it's uh, the, the, the wavelength when the photon the wavelength of the photon when it's observed, right? So the relative size of the universe in the neighborhood of that galaxy and the relative size of, of our you know our world are pretty much the same. But if we look at a galaxy that's very very far away, then uh, you know what they consider to be one unit of length. Is going to be much shorter than ours. Okay? And so this ratio, 1 over 1 plus z, so if it, you know, another way to see that is that z, z equal to 0 is right here. Right? The greater the z is, the greater z is the farther away the object. The farther away the object, the smaller the size of the universe. Because it, it takes light, time, to travel to us. So the object that we're looking at. The way they appear to us is the way they were, they were before, some time ago. And some time ago, the universe, the universe was small. That makes sense? So great, the greater uh, z is, the smaller this quantity, which, as I said, is the relative size of the universe. OK? All right. Uh, so that's just another way of writing z. And at low z, very low z, z is approximately equal to the velocity of the galaxy divided by the speed of light. Okay. So, now, uh, the reason that uh, I put uh, velocity in quotes is because it really is not a velocity, right? It's not like that raisin is, you know, this raisin, raisin 1, is running away from our raisin. It's because the entire bread is rising. So you can, you can, you know, you can assign a number to how fast it's moving away from you, but it's not really velocity in the traditional sense, in the sense that we've understood it in Newtonian physics. Okay? All right. Okay, so I'm going to change the vertical axis now from velocity to z. And at about uh, 1,000 kilometers, z is about 0.8. Okay. And distances remain the same. Parsec uh, is, one parsec is about uh, 3.28 light years. Okay. It's about 3 light years. And uh, also, I've labeled the vertical axis alternatively as the relative size of the universe which is this quantity I told you before, 1 over 1 plus z. Yeah? As z increases, 1 over 1 plus z decreases. Yes? Uh, and for convenience, I'm going to define it as uh, a. A is a time of, uh, a is a function of time, but you can also consider it as a function of z, because the greater z is, the further back we're looking at the universe, the further back in time. Uh, in the, in the 
And so uh, you can also write this uh, quantity A as a function of redshift. Okay? All right. Um, now, Hubble constant, the one that uh, I showed you before, over here, is just velocity divided by distance. Right? And, oops, and uh, A is a dimensionless distance. Right? And a dot, the time derivative of A, is a dimensionless velocity, if you will. And so you can also write Hubble constant as A dot over A. Minimal amount of equations, but they're going to be a few. Um, so note that before I wrote a, uh, h with a subscript 0, and that's called the Hubble constant. That is the value, that is the rate at which the universe is expanding today. Here I write h as a function of z, meaning the rate of the expansion of the universe at a certain time before, at a, at a certain redshift, at a certain distance away from us. Okay? And this quantity is called a Hubble parameter. It's no longer a constant. So far, so good? Feel free to interrupt me with questions. Okay. All right. OK. Now, in order to measure uh, velocity, as it were, it's easy. Because all you have to do is measure how the spectrum shifts. It's sort of the optical Doppler shift. That's the easy part. Distance is difficult. And what Hubble relied on was a type of astronomical objects called Cepheid variable stars. These stars, the, the brightness of these stars vary um, periodically, and the period is proportional to the luminosity. Luminosity is how bright they truly are. So you can measure the, the period that tells the luminosity, and once you know the, the true brightness of an object, by comparing that with the apparent brightness of that object, you can figure out how far away it is from you. Okay. Uh, so that's how uh, he figured out distance, and this is sort of a, a plot that shows you how the luminosity of type 1 cepheid, there turns out there are two types of cepheids. Uh, type 1 cepheids, how the luminosity varies as a, fun as a function of period. Okay. Now, Hubble's value for his constant, for, for his famous constant, 500 kilometers per second per megaparsec. In other words, if an object that's one megaparsec away, it's moving at a velocity of 500 kilometers per second, according to Hubble. Does that make sense? If an object is two megaparsecs away, then it's moving at 1,000 kilometers per second. It turns out that value is way too big. The modern value is about one-seventh of that. And the reason that Hubble didn't get his number right was because it turned out that there are two kinds of settings, a brighter one and a fainter one. And Hubble was comparing the two different kinds of Cepheids in our galaxy versus in the following galaxy. That's how we got to number one. But, you know, the, the basic uh, picture is correct. Okay. Great. So if you, if you compare apple to apples, as it were, if you compare the right kind of Cepheids, the same kind of Cepheids in our galaxy versus Cepheids in another galaxy, that should allow you to extend this picture to greater and greater distances, right? But there's a limitation because the Cepheids are not, are not that bright. So once you get out to about you know, several tens of megaparsecs, the Cepheids are no longer visible. Um, so before we talk about how we can get around uh, that problem, let me just also point out that, as I already said, distance uh, translates to time in the past. Right? So what you're looking at, you can look at this as the distance axis. You can also look at this as the, axis, as the time axis. Um, Okay, so I'm going to do that. Oh, actually, before I do that, I'm going to flip this picture, this uh, this graph, left to right. And there's a reason why I want to do that. Okay, because this is not this is called the Hubble diagram. Uh, this is how Hubble plotted his diagram. But these days we don't plot the Hubble diagram that way. So I'm going to put an orientation that conforms to the way that we plot Hubble diagrams today. Okay, so I'm first going to turn to uh, left to right, and then, uh, as I said, uh, I'm going to label the top, the horizontal axis as time. This is the present. If this is the past, then going this way must be the future. Okay, and then from here to here, from this to the next plot, I'm going to flip upside down. Okay, you see that? One more time. 
Okay. All right. So this is the past. This is the future. And redshift is increasing in this direction. Relative side of the universe is increasing in this direction. The reason I want to flip it this way is because once you realize that this axis represents the relative size of the universe, then you realize that there's a bottom to how low this axis can go. It can't go below zero. Yes? So if you extend, if you believe that this is the correct fit, if you extend that line all the way to zero, that's as low as you can go. This is when, yes? Yeah, Dr. Huang, I'll, I'll point out, I, I've never taken students through these flips, uh -huh. but I'd like to mention it to the audience in, in general that the first one is that observational diagram. By going to this, it can be observational, but it makes it much easier for it to be a theoretical understanding. So my experience with this in talking to students is showing the Hubble plot as we showed it, it's actual measurements. Right. Objects, how far away they are, and how fast they're moving away from us. Right. And I, I want to say I love these two flips, because these flips go into a, a theoretical rather than from where I'm observing, I'm talking about the relative size of the universe. And so when people take home at night their thoughts about what an expanding universe is, they think of a universe that therefore is expanding and then seeing the expansion. Imagine a universe that expands. You might just be about to talk about this. But, but unusual universes, or at least ones that people were thinking about in the, the 70s wondering whether they were true, would be one that expands and then contracts again. And on a plot like this, it's the universe over time gets bigger and then gets smaller again. And so this is the correct way to think of the, the supernova data, which is why I'm, I'm sure you're doing it this way. But I wanted to point out that these two ways of looking at it are as simple as you've done here as two different flips to try to show the same information, but different ways to think about it. Yeah, very true. And um, when you fit cosmological models, this is the orientation. Um, all right, so if you extend this line backwards, when you hit zero, that's as low as you can go, right? And that must be the beginning of the universe, right? Remember, we're looking back, backwards in time this way. Whoops. Yes? And this is Big Bang, and this is roughly the age of the universe. You can get a first order estimate of the age of the universe just based on this linear fit to the data. Now, of course, if you think a little deeper, you realize that gravity is going to slow things down. Yes, as the universe expands, gravity is going to slow things down. And so it's probably not going to be linear. More, more realistically, the universe will start, ex will start to expand faster than it's expanding now. In other words, over time, the expansion rate will be slowing down. Okay? All right. Uh, in fact, what that tells you is that if you observe the past really, really carefully, you can figure out the trajectory the universe, our universe is on. Uh, the reason that everything's pinched at this point is because this is the present. This is, this is defined. Remember, I'm plotting the relative size. Whichever universe you are in, the relative, the, the relative size of the universe today is going to be 1. Right? First of all. Second of all, the slope at this point is measurable. That is what Hubble measured. It's the present rate of expansion of the universe. So not only do all the, all the possible trajectories of the universe meet at this point, they all have to have the same slope at this point. Okay? But if you uh, observe more and more into the, distance, in the, into the distance, and therefore further and further back in, in time, uh, the different models, the different trajectories of the universe will behave differently. And the more carefully you observe the past, the more you are able to differentiate these different trajectories, the better you will be able to predict how the universe is going to evolve in the future. So this blue trajectory tells you that if, if you realize that you observe a whole bunch of objects, all of them fall onto the blue line, and you realize that the expansion of the universe will come to a halt at some great you know, <coughs> distance in time, and then eventually uh, it will uh, experience what's called a big crunch. Okay? And the, uh, the, green, the green line tells you the universe will keep on expanding, but the rate will slow down further and further and further. And, and the red uh, slows down uh, even, uh, you know, the, 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 the rate is slowing down less than the green line. It is not that different from throwing something into the air 
And if you don't give it a lot of this kinetic energy, it'll fall back down. And that corresponds to this scenario. If you plot the trajectory of an object and you throw it into, into the air versus time, it'll look just like that. Okay? And if there's enough energy, then the object may never come back. If, if you throw it with a velocity greater than the escape velocity, it'll never come back. If you throw it just at its escape velocity, then it can barely escape the Earth's gravitational force. So basically, these are the possible three scenarios uh, of the universe as well. Okay. okay, so what we really want to know is the future. Yeah? We want to, in order to know the future, we have to map the past, map out the past really, really well. Okay, so as I said, the problem with the Cepheids is that they are very accurate, but they're not that bright. So if you go beyond several tens of megaparsecs, they're no longer observable. People have been looking for another type of objects, and over the course of uh, 10 years or so, 1985 and 1995, it became more and more clear that a particular type of supernova, which is, the, which is an exploding star, it's called type 1a supernova, may fit the bill. And now let me tell you a little bit about type 1a supernovae type, type supernova and why it is that they may fit the bill. Okay, so um, this is how most astronomers sort of picture what's going on uh, with, within the type 1a uh, supernova system before it explodes. We typically think of the type 1a, type 1a supernova as a binary system where a very compact star known as a white dwarf is orbiting uh, with, in orbit with uh, another star. And that star, we typically think of it as main sequence, a main sequence star or a red giant. Could it be another white dwarf? It could be. But most people uh, somehow have that kind of picture in mind. If you want to talk more about this, you know, I'm happy to talk about it. It's, it's, it's really uh, a lot of speculations at this point. Um, OK. Uh, and the white dwarf, if it can accrete matter from uh, its companion, if the mass of the white dwarf reaches a critical value, <coughs> the Chandra Sekar limit, which is about 1.4 times the mass of the sun, the electron degeneracy pressure can no longer sustain the star against gravity. A white dwarf, unlike our sun, is not burning nuclear fuel in its interior. And so the, it, has to have, it has to have some mechanism to sustain itself against gravity, or else it would be a black hole. And in the case of a white dwarf, uh, the mechanism through which the star sustains itself is a quantum mechanical effect called um, the electron degeneracy pressure. Okay? However, if the white dwarf accumulates enough matter so that the total mass exceeds that value, the electron degeneracy pressure is no longer sufficient to balance gravity and the object will implode, and all the nuclear fuel will get burnt uh, in a matter of seconds, and it becomes a supernova explosion. Okay? Uh, and because they more or less have the same amount of fuel, they have nearly uniform peak luminosity. So as, as you can imagine, an explosion, during explosion, the, the, the star will brighten up, reaches its maximum brightness, and then fade away. At its maximum, uh, we expect that they have more or less the same luminosity. Okay? Not only that, so that's a good thing, right? Because remember, you want to know the luminosity of an object if you want to figure out how far away it is. Here you have, you have a kind of object that wherever it explodes in the universe, all of them have about the same luminosity. Right? So that's great. Gets better because at its peak, a single type 1a supernova can be as bright as an entire galaxy, which means you can see them all the way across from the other side of the universe. Okay? And so these are standard candles. Not only are they standard candles, they're standard candles on cosmological scales. If you want to know, if you read the story, Chandra Sekar was on his way to Cambridge, um, you know, on a boat, except three months or whatever. I think he was like 19 years old. And he figured this all out. Or even Dr. Cambridge. Anyway, so this is the picture that astronomers had in their heads uh, for a long time. It turns out that it's a little too naive. Uh, a recent paper uh, by Richard Stalzo uh, pointed out that 
not every supernova explodes at 1.4 times the mass of the sun. There are sub-Chandra uh, sub um, supernovae. Those are the supernovae that have mass less than 1.4. They have you know, maybe 1.2, 1.25, the mass of the sun. And then the green ones are more or less, more or less half the mass uh, as, as Chandra Sekhar uh, thought they would. Uh, and the red ones are super Chandra. They would have mass 1.45, the mass of the sun. But you can still make them standard. Now, do you see that? So, so I, sometimes I, I can go a little too, too fast. So what you're looking at is how the luminosity varies uh, over time. Yes, As you can see, super Chandra um, supernovae clearly are brighter than the normal uh, supernovae, and, and they're also brighter than the sub um, supernovae, right? And so that seems to go against what I said earlier, which is that all of them explode at about the same peak luminosity. That's true. They, strictly speaking, don't explode at the same luminosity, at the same peak luminosity. But you can standardize them by realizing that the brighter ones also have a broader light curve, and the fainter ones have a narrower light curve. So you can correct the brightness by uh, watching their width. And if you make a correction, then all of them have the same peak magnitude. Okay? And so really, they are standardizable candles, not standard candles. Okay? All right. Now, uh, Scott mentioned earlier that a big discovery was made about 17 years ago. Back then, they didn't know about this. But they did know about the relationship between peak brightness and uh, uh, the width of the light curve. It's an empirical, it's, it's a piece of the empirical knowledge that they have. And so they did exactly that. So these supernovae, different colors represent different supernovae. supernovae. They don't all have the same peak brightness. They, they do now because they've been corrected by the width of their, their, of their light curve. Okay? So they, they didn't know that. And there were two teams. One team led by uh, Saul Perlmutter uh, at Lawrence Berkeley Lab. Another group led by Brian Schmidt uh, and Adam Rees. Brian Schmidt uh, is an astronomer from Australia. Uh, Adam Schmidt uh, did his PhD at Harvard, but his postdoc uh, at Berkeley. So it's interesting that both teams had strong Berkeley connections. Uh, I've been told that there, there used to be mud football played in the afternoon mm -hmm. with people from opposing teams who were teasing each other during their mud football. Anyway, um, so. These two teams ob observed several dozen of high redshift supernovae, supernovae that are very far away. And they plotted their data on the Hubble diagram, sort of the enlarged version of that, but relative size versus time, just as we saw before. Yeah. And what you realize is that the models that people had at the time, the models for the universe that people had at the time, consist only in matter. And you realize that none of these models fit the data. In order to fit the data, you have to assume a different kind of model. The reason the models that people had in mind, none of them fit the data, was because all of those models, all of those models only had matter. If a universe only had matter, it can only do one thing. It can decelerate. That's the only thing it can do. Okay? And the models that fit the data includes an acceleration part in its evolutionary history. So the universe started out decelerating. Right, so the, the, the slope tells you whether it's, uh, 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 the change of slope tells you whether it's decelerating or accelerating. But at some point, it turns and begins to accelerate. And these models fit the data. And this was a huge uh, surprise. Um, so what does that mean? Oh, by the way, so Hubble's original uh, plot fits into an area about that. Uh, that's why he couldn't have discovered it. He's done it for his time. Okay. Uh, so, distant supernovae appear fainter than expected. Distance super, distant supernovae appear fainter than expected. The, the implication of that is that the universe is not only expanding, but that expansion is accelerating. So, first of all, let me say a little bit about uh, why do I say that distant supernovae appear fainter than expected. So, at a given redshift, let's say a redshift, so here's redshift let's say redshift one, if our universe does not, our universe only uh, decelerates, then you expect a supernova to be disparate. But it, so up, up above is the, is the relative brightness. But if the universe is accelerating, it's fainter. Okay. 
All right, so the universe, the implication is that the universe is accelerating. But let's be careful here. I remember where I was when I heard the news. I was a graduate student at Berkeley. I was living in a co-op. If you don't know what co-op is, come talk to me after uh, 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 this talk. And uh, I had a mathematician friend who lived in a co-op. And he said, hey, did you hear about this? You know, this, this discovery made today. And I, I said, what is it? He said, well, the universe is accelerating. I said, yeah. Some, somebody made some mistake, I'm sure. Um, and one criticism that has lasted a long time is how do you know whether it's cosmic acceleration or is it dust? Right? Because if, you think, if, if the evidence is that the supernova appears fainter than you think, Dust will do the trick. There's dust in the universe. Okay? And so I will go through the next few slides addressing that issue because if you don't, if you can't address, if you can't understand how dust can possibly affect your affect your measurement, then you cannot make that uh, claim that the universe, the expansion is accelerating. Uh, so I would like to quote Dr. Seuss. It's fun to have fun, but you have to know how. <laughs> I think the version for scientists is that it's fun to make discoveries, but you have to know the systematics. <laughs> systematics, by systematics, I mean systematic error, systematic uncertainty, such as dust, things that you don't know about, that can, that can bias your measurement. All right. Um, so, uh, how many of you remember the superluminal neutrino story? Yes. And it's, oops. It's because this cable is not screwed in. It's connected, but it's not screwed in. This is before, this is after. After they fixed that problem, that anomaly went away. <laughs> There's another reason, but that reason is far less important. This is the major reason. So you have to understand the systematics, or else you'll be making claims that it's not true. Okay, so systematics. What, what are the kind of systematic uncertainties an astronomer has to deal with? when it comes to using supernovae to measure the evolution of the universe. First, there's systematic error, systematic uncertainty associated with the birth of the supernova explosion, or the birth of the supernova photon. And it's a very, very complicated explosion physics. Uh, all I can say is that empirically, we know that all, all that uncertainties amount to less than 0.15 magnitude. So for those of you who don't know the magnitude system, uh, the smaller the number, the brighter the object. So magnitude one is first magnitude, it's very bright. Magnitude six is the sixth magnitude, it's faint. Okay. Um, and then along the journey of a supernova photon, there are several possible systematics. One is in the host galaxy, there could be dust. Okay. And then on its way from its host galaxy to our galaxy, the intergalactic journey, and it turns out that it could encounter gravitational lenses that can distort its path. And finally, there's dust in our Milky Way galaxy. Sorry for not spelling it out. Uh, MW stands for Milky Way. Okay? But it turns out that the dust in the Milky Way is largely understood. So we, that is under control. Uh, these two parts we have to think a little harder about. So how much time do I have? 15 minutes. 15 minutes. I think I need to really speed up. Sorry, uh, let's see. Okay, so the, so the next slide is really cool. Uh, so, so how many of you know that this is the, this is the 25th year of um, Hubble's, the launch of the Hubble Space Launch? Um, it, it's just it's astonishing. So I'm going to show you a couple of slides um, uh, commemorating the 25th uh, anniversary that's very much relevant to uh, what we uh, are talking about here. So the way to get a handle on, on dust is the following. It's to realize that dust not only dims, but also reddens. So if you look at sun behind thick smoke, you realize it's not only is it fainter, but this part is redder than, than the part of the sun that's less obscured by dust. And you see this in astronomical uh, scenarios. This is the famous Horsehead Nebula. It's a huge plume of interstellar dust. You see these very faint stars piercing through the thick dust. The faint ones uh, don't make it. The light on the faint ones don't make it at all. But if you look at the same uh, object, in the infrared, infrared light has a much uh, better chance of penetrating through thick dust. So now you see all the, even the fainter ones. These are the three brighter ones. But you realize that the three brighter ones, not only are they fainter, but they're also redder. And so that's the way to get a handle on dust, which is you look at your supernovae, 
that you've measured that are very, very far away. You ask yourself, are they, um, are they redder than I expected? If they're not, then I'm okay. I'm simplifying it, but that's basically how we got handled on the, on, on the dust. Okay? So as I said, I'm going to have to speed up. Um, there are other uh, evidences. That there are much stronger evidences than, than what I just said. Uh, what, I'm, what I'm telling you is the kind of evidence that people considered uh, when the discovery was made in 1998, 1999. Now we have stronger evidence. But as I said, I'm going to have to move on. Uh, so the other uh, kind of effects that you have to worry about is gravitational lensing. Gravitational lensing basically says that if there's a very massive object between uh, the source of the light and the observer on Earth, uh, the light path can be bent. And that very massive object can act like a magnifying glass, a magnifying glass. So the object you're looking at can be can appear brighter than they actually are. But this also distorts uh, your observation. Uh, but it turns out that in order for this effect to be uh, uh, to to, to uh, affect your measurement about the universe, the alignment between the distant supernova and the massive object in between, and your telescope has to be nearly perfect. And that rarely happens. That's one reason that's not, it turns out to be not a big concern. The other reason is that if you observe enough supernovae, it actually averages out. Okay. All right, so let me see here. Um, okay, so, so I need to go through the, 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 the next uh, piece of evidence, which I think is, is the strongest evidence. The, stronger, the strongest evidence comes from the fact that now there are observations that have nothing to do with supernovae that have independently measured the acceleration of the universe. So the acceleration of the universe is um, a, a, the, the cause for the acceleration of the universe. People call that the dark energy. And dark energy uh, is given the Greek symbol lambda, as you saw. The density, the relative density of dark energy is given the, symbol, the Greek symbol omega. So this is a measurement based on baryon acoustic oscillation and the cosmic microwave background. And it measures clearly a non-zero, um, about 70% dark energy density. This has nothing, absolutely nothing to do with supernova, is not affected by dust in any way, is not even affected by gravitational lensing. So, uh, so this is 2009. I think all of these things have to come together before the Nobel Committee can say, all right, these three people are going to win the Nobel Prize. Um, anyway, so, Okay, so today's understanding of the universe is that it consists 73% of dark energy, 23% of dark matter, and 4% of normal matter. How many of you heard of the book, The 4% Universe? That's what it's referring to. Right? What you and I are made up of the 4% stuff. We, we have little idea about uh, what dark matter is made up of, but we have some idea, uh, and we have almost zero idea about it. All right, so let's see. Uh, so let me, let me move a little faster. So this is how many supernovae we had in 1998. This is how, it's the same plot. This is how many supernovae we have in the year 2012. Okay. Uh, this is a cool plot, but I don't have time to go through. I'm just going to jump ahead. Um, so what causes the acceleration? Dark energy. It's just really just a label to cover our ignorance. Um, the simplest dark energy model is Einstein's lambda. Einstein's cosmological concept. Think about the irony of it. <coughs> His biggest blunder turned out to be right. Um, now, if dark energy is lambda, then the density of dark energy stays constant as the universe evolves. It is a constant, it's just a number, whatever it is. Okay? Um, so, the first thing you want to know whether this simplest model for dark energy is actually the reality is to see whether dark energy changes with time or not. And that means you want to focus on supernovae at a redshift between 0.5 and 1.7. So we're pushing further and further away. Okay? And the reason for that is because, so what I'm plotting here is uh, dark energy density. Don't worry about that. Just look at this as the dark energy density. This is how well we know the dark energy density in the redshift range between 0 and 0.5, we know that really, really well, 73%, you know, 72.9 plus minus 1.4%. How well do we know dark energy density between the redshift of 0.5 and 1.0? Not very well at all. How well do we know dark energy density between 
redshift of z, uh, redshift of one and three, virtually not. Okay, and so this is why if we want to know whether the you know, whether the density of dark energy varies over time, then we really need to bring down this uncertainty in this range and in this range. Okay. okay. Um, All right, so let me just go through a couple of uh, fun things. Uh, one is that sometimes we do find <coughs> supernova that are almost almost directly behind uh, a galaxy, and therefore can be magnified. So this is a cluster of galaxies, and, and, and this object, for example, is a highly distorted background object. This tells you that it has a lot of gravitational potential can distort, that, that can distort uh, photons that go around it. Uh, and we observed a supernova behind uh, not directly behind, but close enough, and that get magnified. And there are a couple others, and here's, a, here's the, well, it's, uh, here's a summary. So we've observed 40%, about 40%, and this one is 60% magnification of supernova. That makes sense? So the supernova, this supernova appears 37% brighter than it should have been. This supernova appeared 36% than it should have been. So you want to correct for those, or else it's going to mess up your measurement of the universe. Okay, um, all right, so maybe we probably want to leave a few minutes for questions, right? So We can, we can have the question session after that. So if, if I, I often need to let some of the students go around 5, okay. but we can stay at so 5.15 or later with questions. Okay, all right, so uh, let me see how I would like to proceed. Okay. So if you just take a moment, I'm just going to say to the audience the, that uh, I'd like to point out that, that the press often likes to talk about, is Einstein wrong with this or Einstein wrong with that? Um, take Frontiers of Astronomy if you want to hear my take on that. But, but, um, but for now, realize that he wrote down a thing in an equation, uh, 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 applying general relativity to, to the universe as a whole, and he writes down a term mistakenly, because he thinks he's balancing stuff to make the universe as it is. But it's the wrong term, but it can exist in there. He, he said this, this, the equation could look like this, and then he felt terrible for having put in a term and an equation when he didn't have any reason to put it in there. So that's the blunder. The, the thing that Dr. Huang is showing us is that when people are carefully measuring the universe, that term exists. There's something that we don't understand about the universe that Einstein was clever enough to, in his mistake, put this term in, in an understanding of what the universe could be doing. All right, so I, I think I figured out a way to uh, move forward. I think this is an important part of the discussion. This is our Milky Way, and you see all this dark stuff. It's dust. Our Milky Way has a dust lane. It's a plane of dust. And it's important because when we observe at an object, extragalactic through the dust, we want to understand how the dust is obscuring that object. It's also important because you and I, everything in this room is made up of interstellar dust. Um, so let me speed up a little bit. Uh, let's see. Stop responding because of this. Okay. Um, now, the <coughs> dust in a supernova host galaxy, this is still a mystery. So we're talking about a galaxy far, far away from where we are. How, how, do, how does the dust property in that galaxy compare with the dust property in our galaxy? galaxy? It's not clear, okay? So I'm gonna give you two examples. Uh, two supernovae that are highly ridden, that are highly obscured by the dust in their own galaxy. But their dust property turned out to be very, very different. This one I particularly like because it is uh, probably the closest type 1A supernova in 400 years. How was it discovered? It was discovered because an astronomer was training for undergraduate students on a 14-inch telescope on January 2014. Here's the student, this one, was, was making the log that night. This is the telescope that made the discovery. Who knows? I know you guys have a great facility here, so you, know, you never know. Uh, so this is the galaxy in which it was discovered. This is a supernova. This is a prettier picture of the galaxy. It's really a, a, a very astounding looking galaxy, M82. Uh, if you, if you uh, do careful measurements, you come up with this number, RV, which really tells you how large the, the dust grain sizes are. 
Small RV tells you that probably the screen size is small. Okay? So that's one supernova that's highly, highly obscured by the dust in, in, in its own galaxy. And we conclude that RV is small. And as I said, RV tells you twin size, average twin size. Here's another supernova, the one that I've been working on in the last year. Uh, it's, it sits in this galaxy. And can you see the dust lane there? Yes? It sits on the dust lane. OK? And you know, my, my two students and I worked from last summer to now. Teaching really cuts into your research time. But anyway, uh, so we got an RV twice as large, 2.9 which tells you that the dust wing size is not large. So we don't understand why it is that in one case it's, it's much smaller than the other. But those are the kinds of systematics that we, we're struggling with, okay? Um, that's fine, uh, that's basically how I did it, but we, we don't have to talk about that. Um, uh, this is fine too, uh, okay. So as I was working on this, I realized, you know, what I was doing was restoring the true appearance of the supernova. A supernova that is obscured by dust, through a, um, you know, my algorithm, what I'm doing is I'm removing the dust by software. Uh, and it reminded me of 20 years ago, I guess, uh, when people started to clean the system chapel. You remove all this grime to reveal what, what the painting really looked like. And if you look at this picture, not only is it fainter than that one, it's redder. Look at the scarf. Green is redder than blue, right? So that's kind of what happened in the supernova. All right, so conclusion. Einstein's cosmological constant, lambda, is still an excellent agreement with all observation data. Really astounding, 100 years later. To find out whether he's right or wrong sounds very exciting. To work with systematics, man, that's pain in the neck. But to get to the point where you want to be, you have to deal with systematics. Um, I will leave this slide. Uh, I came across this. This is Einstein's seminal paper on cosmology. This is the paper. It has been cited only 27 times in 100 years. But look at who cites him. First, Friedman. Friedman cited him in 1922. And every cosmologist worked with one equation it's called Friedman. Uh, it was cited in, in uh, 2012 by one of the Nobel Prize winners, and it was cited again uh, in 2012, Planck, the latest Planck satellite cosmology distance. So I guess it's not how many times it's cited, it's who cites you. <laughs> With that, uh, thank you.